Uh, good morning, everyone. Just can't give you some general announcements, get them out of the way this morning. Um, as far as our food distribution is concerned, the Lord did bless us with uh, a grant out of the Sturge Area Foundation, so we're able to continue with that ministry. Um, things were kind of up in the air there for a moment, but uh, they gave us some money, so we'll be able to keep going for a little while longer. And uh, so that's a blessing. I remember when Dave and Dan and I met, it was uh, David word of prayer, and he was saying that, uh, Lord, if you want us to continue, just uh, provide the means to do so. And I had already applied for the grant, but typically when you apply for grants in the um, secular sector, that when you have the, the term ministry associated with your name, uh, it turns off a lot of people because they don't want to be affiliated politically or with a religious agenda. And uh, But the Lord definitely provided through that. So uh, we'll definitely be here Saturday from 9 until noon to pass out food to individuals that need it. As far as the message this morning, uh, Nehemiah consists of quite a few chapters, and there's no way I'm going to be able to get through this entire book this morning, uh, not with everybody dozing off, so uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, yeah, we could keep you here, but then there's no sense of flogging, flogging the message to you, but uh, I just want to highlight some points that as we go through, and as I, I was studying for this message this morning, it became more of a commentary on our social justice and our, a lot of social situations. Um, I have a minor in sociology in college. My ma major is criminal justice, but uh, we study a lot of groups, and it just seems like a lot of the sermons that I, the Lord presses upon me has to deal with social issues. And that's just uh, a, a byproduct of the career, I guess. But we're definitely going by verse, verse by verse here. But Nehemiah addresses several situations that are going on within, within Israel. And Israel is, the church is often compared to Israel because we're just like them. Because we, we have the accountability, we have the law, we have the rules, things that we know that we are supposed to do. But there are times where we, we, we fall short of that and the devil gets on in our mind and we get very uh, easily manipulated by the things of the world. So uh, you'll see a lot of comparisons and I'm going to stop a little bit um, through going through chapter 5 this morning. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we struggle with uh, it's from, a, from a social standpoint. And so... Um, Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, then we'll get into the message. Well, it's gracious Heavenly Father, just give you thanks and praise for today, Lord, and I thank you for the, the family of God that you provided for us, Lord, and uh, I just thank you for your, your grace, thank you for your mercy, and though we don't deserve it, you uh, gave us a gift of eternal life. And Father God, I just ask you'll be with us. Uh, the message this morning, just let it be your words that are said, and not mine, but uh, Father God, just ask that you be with those that are away from us this morning, whether it be for illness or travel, give them traveling mercies, and uh, put your healing hand upon those that, that can't be here for those those problems, Father God, and we just lift up a Calvary Chapel to you, Lord, we want to do your work, we want to do your service, and just uh, give us those opportunities, Lord. We ask all these things in your precious and most holy name. Amen. So quick review. We're going through the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is this guy that's basically caught in captivity. He's part of the Assyrian conglomerate, King Artaxerxes. He's the cupbearer to the king, which is a pretty high position in the king's court. And basically he's a food taster, a wine taster, to ensure that the king does not get poisoned. And because he's in captivity, I was talking about, we talked about 
how Israel was in captivity, not only in Egypt, but several hundred years later, then they become captives of Babylon. Babylon. This is where uh, the story Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego comes out, King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, not, not real fond of Jews and people following the ways of God. Then King Artaxerxes is in here, and he's the cupbearer, but King Artaxerxes is actually the a stepson of Esther. Remember the book of Esther, right? And that's how God put her in that position to detract or stop some of the anti-Semitism that was going on within that kingdom. And so for whatever reasons God put Nehemiah in this capacity to f fulfill God's work in Jerusalem. And it's amazing to see the qualities of leadership and the education that Nehemiah has. And the, the book does not go into what his background is, and it's unfortunate that we don't. But I imagine if he's part of the king's court, he's had some education, he's, he's brought up in the ways of the Jewish law because, as we see in Chapter 5, he really articulates some very important things that the Jewish or Hebrews were supposed to follow at that time. So we talked, went through... Uh, Chapter 4, and here they got problems coming from the outside. These, these guys, Sanabalit, Tobiah the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arab, they're just poking fun at the Israelites or the, uh, the Jews that were trying to rebuild this wall. And then one guy makes this comment, kind of tongue in cheek, where, what are these guys doing? They're trying to build this wall. If a fox jumps up there, it's just going to fall over. They're just going to mess everything up. Um, and a little sarcasm there then uh, let me look at um, chapter 4 and I'm going to read verses 21 to the end there then we'll jump into chapter 5 so we labored in the work and half of the men <clears throat> excuse me held a spear from daybreak until the stars appeared at the same time I also said to the people let each man and his servant stay the night in Jerusalem that they may be our guard by night and working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except for everyone took them off for washing. Nehemiah has a sense of humor here. Uh, we call it hyperbole, right? A little bit of an exaggeration. He's talking about the people were working day and night. They had people that were keeping guard at night, so the people weren't invading because these, these naysayers and these outside countries were trying to really mess with what the Jews are trying to do to this wall. And so anything that they could do to distract them. So Nehemiah tells them to, okay, we're going to just keep spear in one hand and work with the other, basically. But then he's, we're working so hard. I don't know if anybody has worked that hard, or I know being a musician, from time to time, you get those real late nights, you get home 4 o'clock in the morning, and you don't even feel like getting out of your clothes. You're just that tired from lugging gear and loading equipment and the, the plane and all that stuff. It's a real hot venue sometimes. And so he's just like, other than shedding your clothes, you know, that there's not a whole lot that goes on with putting stuff away. and You just get that to that in the next morning. So Nehemiah kind of uses a little sense of humor here. It's like, yeah, we worked all the time. We, we slept in our clothes so we can just get up and work. I remember when I was a kid, I'd, prob I'd do that. I, mean, I was going to run, run away from home one time. So I slept in my clothes. So I was ready to go before everybody got up. And then I slept too late and missed my opportunity. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's the stuff that we do. Even our soldiers would do this, uh, fire people. Uh, firemen just have all their gear just ready to jump into if something they get called on on a call. So this is what Nehemiah is getting at. Is they, the, the gravity of the situation was there. They had to work. They had to do what they had to do to complete the wall. They're completing their mission. But this is going to lead into some issues in Chapter 5. So let, let me read in Chapter 5, starting with verse 1. And there was a great outcry of people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, We are sons, and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain 
because of the famine. There are several things going on here. The countrymen are working on the wall, and when you're doing one thing, that detracts your attention from another. And they didn't have the opportunity to plant fields, to tend to their crops, to make sure things were going like they were supposed to, like tending to their livestock. They were just 100% focused on building this wall around Jerusalem. So any time that you don't have crops available or food available, you're in a famine, right? We see it around here. If we have real bad rains or we have bad drought, that's going to affect the overall availability of grain and food for, for people, and then that causes inflation, and we deal with that whole aftermath from, from the impact of a drought or other types of famine. And we saw where Joseph had experienced that in Egypt, where he actually interpreted the king's dream. So you're going to have seven years of famine, you're going to have seven years of productivity, um, you just need to do this, store it up, and we'll be able to get through all of this. Uh, so because of the focus that is on the wall building around Jerusalem, there is this distraction. And so essentially the wives are saying that because of this, we don't have food to feed our family. And so this opens up a lot of opportunity for exploitation, if you will. Because what happens is there's nobles and there's people of higher status that are within the community, the Jews. Maybe they think it's above them to, to work hard labor. And I know that some people are like that today or they don't... Uh, They'd rather sit behind a desk, push a pencil, and not get out there and be with the, the troops or be with the, the people or that are actually doing the work. And we see that, especially in, in the government where I work, that uh, we call it the ivory tower, where people are very, so far removed from people on the ground doing the job that they lose sight of what's actually going on in the ranks. So it's very important. And Nehemiah is an awesome leader. If you ever did look at management, or if you get promoted to look over people, go through the book of Nehemiah because that is going to give you so much insight on how to work with people. Because Nehemiah does a couple of things that we need to emulate. He, once he learned of the problems in Jerusalem, the walls not being built, the, the tombs of his fathers are destroyed, he mourned, right? He, he cried, but he prayed. He sought the wisdom of God through all of that. So you being in, a, in the labor force as a Christian, there is no problem with you to pray to yourself, pray to God. And you see that Nehemiah has almost made a science out of this. He, he, he will actually seek the wisdom of God in almost every decision that he makes. And that is something that we really need to take, take hold of because end up making decisions on our own what happens if they're based on our gut it doesn't always turn out so well and we actually respond to other stimuli or other things that are going on instead of wisdom from God as to how we need to approach situations so here they got some problems going on and now I said there's going to be some parallels with our, our modern day right now, there's a quote that I heard, especially dealing with church quarrel. You know, the devil's got a way to attack from the outside. He's got people and politicians and people, because we wrestle not against principalities and powers, but against rulers of darkness, right? And so we're dealing with these external factors, but the devil has a way of getting two Christians from inside the church. It's kind of that if I can't beat him, join him mentality. Well, he's not here to worship God. He's here to mess with you. And we've heard these stories, and they're horrible, how churches split because they didn't agree with the building program because they wanted mauve carpet instead of wine-colored carpet. And it becomes so divisive amongst these people that there's actually church splits that occur. And this is a quote, and there's so much to it. 
is that the devil does not take sides in a church quarrel, but he will provide ammunition to both sides. So that's just sit back and watch. And when I'm dealing with, when I used to deal with inmates and such, and you have them in a residential facility, it becomes a game. It's like, let's see if we can't get somebody geeked up because if something were to happen, they get returned to the in custody. And so they just sit there and start poking the bear and see if they can make these guys go on. And that's what happens in a church. The devil just sitting back poking you. See what's going on. It's like, oh, maybe you don't agree with the chairs that are in here. Or maybe you don't agree with the pews that we have. Um, or we're using the wrong version of the Bible. We're using the English Standard Version instead of the NIV. Or using the New James, New King James as opposed to the King James. And... I grew up in a very conservative church, and the King James was the only thing. thing. It's like the, if it's not King James Version, it's perversion. <laughs> Daniel Dave's heard that. But that's causing this inviting. And, but then you have the New International Version that came out, which is, they say they went back to the original transcripts from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they tried to, make the appropriate interpretations. There are some differences and there are some nuances uh, where they actually have done the research and there's some stuff that is solid. But beware of that. Um, English Standard Version is a really good version. But nonetheless, the point I'm trying to make here is that the devil is going to try to mess with you. If he's not succeeding from the people on the outside messing with you, criticizing, mocking you, He's going to try to take care of you from the inside. That's where the inviting comes in. And so this is what's happening in chapter 4. There's a lot of strife that comes within the Jewish community while they're trying to rebuild these walls. And they're trying to... We as people, we like to know where our bed is. We like to know where our food's coming from. We like to be secure, right? Right? But if you take away our food, you take away our shelter, then we're in crisis mode. And this is what's going on with the the Jewish people in in Jerusalem at this time because some needs weren't being met, so things get out of hand. So let's go on to to, the verse 4 here. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's taxes, our lands and vineyards. For the, the king's tax on the lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children are as their children, and indeed we are forcing our own sons and daughters to be slaves, as some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. This is from their own people that's causing this problem. This is not coming from Symbolic, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab. This is coming from their own people. And again, here's our modern day comparison. We hear of predatory lending. We say, why you're paying 30% on a credit card because maybe your credit score is a little bit lower than it should be. Uh, and I've mentioned this before in previous sermon where uh, in Benton Harbor, back in the 60s, there was a lot of racial uh, strife that was going on during that time. It was all over the country. But there's this thing called blockbusting, where the lenders would get in there, they'd sell homes to people knowing full and well they weren't going to be able to to meet or fulfill that loan. Bank forecloses on it, all of a sudden it becomes bank bank property. They could sell it for a higher margin, higher profit to whomever, but broke the back of the people that tried to buy it originally. And usually they were minorities. Here you have your own countrymen saying, Okay, well, if you don't have the money to pay for the taxes, you don't have money to buy grain, I'm going to lend it to you. And sometimes this interest was at 50%. And I haven't seen anything that high because we have a lot of legislation in effect right now uh, because of this reason. But the predatory lending still happens. I don't know if anybody of you or any of you have you ever used a... Uh, Payroll advance place. Uh, cash advance is one of them. Money go. 
uh, some of these other places. If you start reading the fine print on those documents, I only know this because I had a, some guys that were committing fraud with it. Uh, but the document, this is almost 40% interest. You have $40 on $100. These people are charging 50% of whatever. It's like, okay, I'm going to lend you this much money to pay for your taxes to the king because this king Artaxerxes, you can't tell him to go get bent because you're not happy with the taxation rate uh, because you can end up getting killed over it. But so, so you have all this financial stuff, and this still goes on today. But then this leads me down this rabbit trail of slavery. And this is where that social commentary comes. I'm going to read you some statistics from antislavery.org. So I didn't make this up. Right now, there are 49.6 million people that live in modern slavery. One quarter of that are children. Twenty-two million of this type of thing is are there enforced marriages. But let me tell you about how, how this oppression is going on, and I'm talking about financial oppression. There's somebody that's very, very close to me that caught up, got caught up in uh, some internet pornography situation. And he was doing some things over the internet he probably shouldn't have been doing. It's my former business partner, and I'll tell you more about the story if you're interested, but not in this context. But what was going on is that he's trolling this thing for, for live pornography, and he ends up in the country of Cambodia looking at some underage children that were doing sexual acts and things like that. And that in and of itself is disgusting, but it wasn't the kids that were doing it. It was their parents. They were forcing them to subject themselves to engage in these types of activities because of the money. And then where my former business partner gets gets caught up is he already had a cease and desist order from copying DVDs illegally. So he already caught their attention. And the FBI is watching his IP address, but all of a sudden he's trolling around these uh, foreign internet sites. And folks, it, it doesn't take much to track it down. But this is a financial situation. The families in Cambodia are so poor. They are willing to prostitute their own children for the sake of a dollar so they can have financial security or some type of financial income where they live. This is what's going on in Jerusalem is that these people are so poor being oppressed by their own countrymen, by their own people, that they're forcing them to give up their children into slavery. I mean, yeah, we're 2,500 years apart from this, but the fact that it still goes on is unconscionable. And I'll give you another story. This is somewhat local. Anybody ever been to Grayling, Michigan? Well, there's a Chinese restaurant up there. They're no longer open, but uh, there was a student from Western Michigan University who was up there visiting some friends, and he was learning Mandarin, and he knew some Chinese. But the people that were running the restaurant uh, were, were Chinese nationals, and they're, they're communicating back and forth in Chinese. And what happens is something was said to a young person, and it's not uncommon for people that run restaurants to have their families in their restaurants, so we don't think anything of it, Right? He's like, oh, they don't have child care at home. They just bring the kids to the restaurant. Uh, so this is what we, perhaps what was going on there, just we're assuming that they're family. Something happened where the older Chinese individual says something to the younger one and turned as white as a ghost. But because that Western Michigan University student understood Chinese, 
basically the, the person threatened the child's family. You, you do what I tell you or I am going to have somebody kill your mom and dad. So that kid was here under a human trafficking situation in an indentured servitude or some type of slavery issue. So ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, they were involved, the FBI got involved, and they were able to get that kid out of there. And we've heard this uh, stuff going on with Destiny Rescue and hearing their statistics that were going on with kids that are wrapped up in, in child trafficking or uh, sex trafficking and things to that effect. Um, absolutely reprehensible that this stuff goes on today. And so if you have the ability to help, definitely help Destiny Rescue. And there's other organizations out there that can assist with that. So there's my social commentary on verse 4. So essentially, the Jews are just taking advantage of each other. And uh, so their daughters have been sold into slavery. And it's not our, in our power to redeem them. And when you are poor, folks, and I've come, I come from this part of it, where you are so poor that you don't really know where your next meal is coming from. You know, cause I, my mom well, I was in a single-parent household. My dad left when I was 14. And I was talking to my dad when he told me, he was like, well, what are we supposed to do for money? Well, you're going to have to go on welfare. That was his answer. He was like, well, you're going to be paying child support, dude. But um, it wasn't until I became a corrections or a parole officer uh, I started doing pre-sentence investigation reports. I didn't realize leaving the state when you owe child support was a felony. I was like, that's stanker. You left the state to avoid paying child support, which is a four-year felony. But he ended up having a stroke, and there was some other stuff that happened. So God carried out his own form of justice with that. But these people are pouring off. And it's just kind of like when you're hurt. And, you know, 100 yards, miles be 100 miles if your knee's busted up or something like that. And when you're broke, you know, you're looking at a $2 gallon of milk and you have to make a decision, you know, I don't have any money. I can't buy that gallon of milk. Whereas if you have 100 bucks, it's not that big of a hit for you, right? But these people don't have the money to pay for their taxes. They don't know where their meal's coming from. They're in this famine period. And you have people that are resting on their laurels, if you will, just trying to manipulate, squeeze the sponge as much as they can out of their own people to, to line their own pockets. And look at Nehemiah's response. I love this. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry of these words. Jesus says, be angry and sin not, right? So Nehemiah became very angry. After serious thought, so here's a moment of internal reflection, probably some prayer going on here. I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said to them, Each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. Let us look up Exodus 22:25. Exodus is the second book in the Bible. Exodus 22:25. Exodus 22:25. If you lend money to any of my people, and these are the Jews, the Hebrews, who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not charge him interest. If you take, let me 26, if you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. So there's one. Let us look up Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 19 and 20. In verse 19 of uh, chapter 23 in Deuteronomy, 
you shall not charge interest to your brother, interest on money or food or anything that is lent out as interest. To a foreigner, you may charge interest, but to your brother and but to your brother you shall not charge interest, that the Lord your God may bless you with all to which you set your hand in the land which you are entering to possess. And this is part of that Mosaic law, right? And this is what's applicable to the Hebrews, the, to the nation of Israel. And I've got one more for you. That's going to be Leviticus, chapter 25. Should have had it marked in my Bible, but I do not. Yeah, Dave, can you read that for us? Leviticus chapter 25, verse 39. So essentially, if you did not have money to pay a debt and you wanted to enter it into a, with a, basically an indentured servitude, uh, you were up for a review if, to be released after seven years or the year of Jubilee, which is 50 years. Uh, but this is why Nehemiah was angry. Here's your Mosaic Law. You guys are bound by this. And yet, we have it written in Scripture that this is what we're supposed to be following, that we're not supposed to be charging interest to our brothers. We can charge interest to a, to a foreign. But because there wasn't good leadership in Jerusalem at the time, because they had all this influence from other nations, from other people that didn't believe in, in the Hebrew way, that these things became manip manipulated and lost. And so... This is why Nehemiah is so upset. Can you understand that? He's like, this is the law. You're supposed to follow it. And you're totally blowing it, folks. And so Nehemiah gets a hold of these noblemen and gets on their case about the whole thing. In verse 8, And I said to them, according to, or back in Nehemiah, sorry, uh, Nehemiah, and I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now, indeed, will you even sell your brethren, or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. And I was just imagining this confrontation. It's kind of like chastising a child when they're taking cookies out of the cookie jar and you told them not to. Uh, is that you caught me red-handed, I don't have anything to say. Like, this is what we were doing. And these guys, they know they were doing wrong. They know that they were outside of the law, but yet they chose to do it for their own financial gain. And then this is what Nehemiah says. Then I said, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? In verse 10, it says, I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. So Nehemiah is giving this stuff to his own people. Please let us stop this usury. There's an exclamation point there, so it's pretty important. Emphatic. Restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses, also a hundredth of the money and grain and new wine and the oil that you have charged them. And these people know that they're doing wrong. It's like, yeah, you caught me. And so this is where the, the Spirit of the Lord or God gets and does a lot of legwork beforehand, I believe, because he really convicted these noble men that they, they were in the wrong, they acknowledged that. And so when you have sin in your own life, you need to acknowledge it 
or if you're struggling with an addiction and people that are, have ever sought counseling or been through a counselor or even are counselor themselves, is that first of all, you need to identify their problem. And then you need to seek guidance and counsel from people that know the word, right? And so that's what is going on here. And so in verse 12, so they said, we will restore and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and required an oath from them they would, that they would do according to this promise. And I shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise, even thus may be shaken out and empty. There's a physical gesture. He's shaking out his garment that you should not keep anything else of your own or things that you've taken away from the, the Jews and, and give everything back. And you got to love this response here. And all the assembly said, Amen. And if you've heard a preacher and you like what they have to say, you say Amen. You're in agreement. It's kind of like uh, make it so. Amen. Can I get an Amen this morning? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't fishing for it, but I just thought it was cool. <laughs> Then the people did according to this promise. All right, verse 14. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, so he's a governor for 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread, wine, besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued to work on the wall and did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. So this is a real testament to Nehemiah. He's He's not taking a position for financial gain. He's not doing it for any other reason other than God laid it on his heart. He's not looking. Sometimes you'll see that, well, I can do this and lend some. You see those little loan sharks, right? It's like, oh, I'll give you 500 bucks and I want to see 550 back. Or uh, even like I talked about those check cash advance places. Same kind of bit, you know, you're just trying to hold you upside down and metaphorically shake out your pockets, even though you can't afford it. And sometimes you get so far in debt with those places that you totally lose it. And then it's, oh, yeah, I owe them $10,000. And I've, I've talked to people in fraud cases that have gotten into those things. And just the amount of restitution that they owe is astronomical because if you're only making – 10 bucks an hour, or what minimum wage is now, like 957 or something like that, uh, on 40 hour a week, it's not a lot of money. When your rent's costing you $1,000 a month, you maybe have a car, you gotta buy gas, gas isn't cheap right now, you have to pay for insurance, at least you should, or not get caught. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of demands on our finances. And so Nehemiah was totally within her respect of law to demand money from the people to pay for the governor. And I was trying to think of a comparison like this. The only thing that I could come up with, and I, if you get lost in it, I apologize, but this, that's what I know. Um, Omnibus, Omnibus Crime Control Act 1937 was passed in the state of Michigan. It was like, oh, Big fancy word. Uh, not really. Essentially what it meant was that the Michigan Department of Corrections essentially told local courts that we will supervise your probationers and we will pay for the people to do that, but you are responsible for housing them, 
and providing with them with all the office materials that they need and take care of that. We'll, we'll take care of the employee part of it, but you're responsible for housing and other parts to deal with your, your probation stuff. Because parole is state level stuff, probation is local. And so I've been around long enough where you start dealing with local governments. Uh, things are pretty tight. And you want to see, see a county commissioner or a county official get their gears ground and when you start talking about, hey, the probation department needs this. They need a new copy machine. I'm like, oh, that's $4,000 is not in our budget right now. But because of that Control Act that was passed back in 1937, they're required to do it. And so they have to go find money in their slush funds or I don't know, take a little bit of money out of their road plowing budget or something to pay for this stuff. But it's, it's their responsibility because it's written in the law. Um, so kind of a long way to make a point, but this is exactly what Nehemiah has the right to do. He has the right to charge his, for his wages for being governor of, of Jerusalem. <coughs> But he chose not to do that. In fact, he must have been pretty well off because if you look at the, the type of items that he had, he's feeding these people. All right. And listen to the explanation of what he has here. And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers, besides those came to us from nations around us. Now that which was prepared daily, prepared daily, one ox and six choice sheep, also fowl were prepared for me, and once every ten days in abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions because the bondage was heavy on the people. Nehemiah had empathy on these individuals, and he decides that, he is not going to break the backs of his people. He's going to use what he had, what he had access to, to help take care of his people that were part of this mission of rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. And in verse 19, yeah, verse 19, he says this several times throughout, throughout Nehemiah, remember me, my God, for good according to all that I have done for his people. He's not saying this to say, look what I did, God. But we are such a loathsome people that he is saying, just remember me, God. With everything else he had, I mean, controlling the world and the spinning and the stars, and everything out, remember me, God, this little minuscule person sitting in the middle of Jerusalem. Just remember me, God. Remember what I've done. And that's just his, his plea to God. Just, just don't forget about me. God doesn't really forget about us. No matter how insignificant we feel or how overwhelming a situation is, God has it. He's going to make you go through some things to make you grow. And if being a Christian, you know, you've heard this is a very abused adage, but if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. If that's all you had to do is sign up to be a Christian to avoid it going to hell, then a lot more people would be doing it. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's work. It's work to be a Christian. And like, especially if you've had a significant or legitimate conversion experience is that you are no longer going to want to serve Satan. You are going to want to serve Jesus Christ and the Almighty High God. And that's going to be your only focus. Yeah, we get distracted with stuff, and just like we have a responsibility to mobilize, if we have something on our heart that we need to do, we're going to do it. You just can't sit back and say, I'm not praying about it, and expect everything else to happen. And all of a sudden, you know, the clouds move and the winds move and all of a sudden things are built like building a new church I'm well, just going to sit back and see what happens I'm praying about it but we have a responsibility to mobilize and to move so 
that takes care of chapter 5. I'm not going to get through chapter 6, but um, what you really want to do is, is finish out the book on your own. This is my last week preaching for a while. <laughs> so um, I really like to find spots where I can get done in three weeks or however much time I have. Sometimes I'm doing topical sermons. But Lord, laid it on my, upon my heart to, to bring the case of Nehemiah to you because uh, just because of his leadership. And you look at what, what God did for him. He's a guy born in captivity. He is really a reject from all intents and purposes, but God had it in his plan to make him work for him. And no matter where you are in your life and in your situation, God's got a plan for you. You just got to be smart enough or wise enough to listen to God. Because it doesn't matter your age either, whether you're 12 year old or whether you're hitting your 70s. You still have a place in his kingdom. And uh, I'm going to use an example of Dave, Dave Wall here. He, he wrote a song going out with my boots on. And it, it was predicated by a retired preacher that, that came up and talking about our ministry never stops. Our service for God should never stop. We might have to change capacities. We might have to change responsibilities throughout a lot of other because of physical limitations or mental limitations. But your ability to serve Jesus Christ is never a retirement situation, right? We should never put that on our back burner because God chose you and as I will do my utmost for his highest. And that, that should be your motivation. And whatever, like I said, whatever capacity you have, whether you're a student in school or, um, you know, I talked to somebody a couple weeks ago, and I said, well, what do you think God's plan is for me? I was like, your, your gift is talking to people. Have you ever shared the word with them? If you don't feel comfortable to do that, bring them to church. It's like, oh, yeah, we should probably, probably do that. So with the topic this morning, and there's so much information that, like I said, I'm calling them rabbit trails, social commentaries, whatever, but ultimately the message is find your place, do your part. And if God is in it, he's going to bless it. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> so, uh, but as I close the service this morning, if you need prayer, you want guidance, talk to me, talk to Dave, talk to Ron, to any of us really. We'll pray with you. You want? We'll lay hands on you. We'll ask for God's purpose in your life. You don't know. But your first and foremost responsibility is sharing the gospel. You know, some of some people have their calling, and it's written in the stars or whatever. They see the smoke signals, and they know what their their requirement is, what they need to do with their life. You know, I told you a couple weeks ago that mine. It took me over twenty years to actually succumb to ministry. I was doing my own thing. It's like I was doing Christian music ministry, and I thought that was enough. See, I've been in three or four different Christian bands, and it's like, yeah, I'm just giving this part to God, and you know, I'm doing my thing too. Um, it's not enough. He broke me. There, I got. I give up. It's kind of like picking up a turtle, and their legs are still moving. <laughs> It's like, no, I still want to go do my thing. Oh, you pick up a little kid, you know, <laughs> and they're still wiggling around. They want to do what they want to do. But no, you, you are God's possession. You need to fulfill his purpose. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I just uh, give you thanks and praise. I, I thank you for putting Nehemiah as a leader in Jerusalem. Thank you for the story that we can share 
over 2,000 years later and still have modern day context and relation. And Lord, just give us the opportunity to, to read further and explore your word and uh, find our place where you want us to serve, Father God. Uh, just if anybody is here this morning that's struggling with something or maybe not sure what God's direction is for their life, it's, you know, pray you lay it upon their heart, give them a clear vision of that, Father God. And Lord, just... Uh, Ask all of these things in your most precious and holy name. Amen.